Good morning. All right. This morning, Lord willing, I want to talk about loving your husband. And, of course, these principles are going to apply to a lot of things uh, of loving others, especially thinking about loving people that are difficult to love. Uh, Those of you that were here last night, you heard my testimony and how God changed me from a rebellious, self-serving feminist who had no capacity to love God or to love others, but he changed me to a servant of God whose greatest joy is to love my husband and be submissive to him. Now, um, as I've sought to know God's will for my life and my marriage, and from studying the scriptures, I've, I kind of boiled it down to three main things, that three main biblical responsibilities that the wife has. One is to love her husband, one is to show respect to him, and one is to be biblically submissive to him unless he asks her to sin. Now, when my mother <clears throat> read the excellent wife book, and it came out, tw- <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> 26 years ago, uh, she told me, she said, I don't think the girls are going to like this book. I said, I don't either. <laughs> I don't like it uh, in, in a way. But I said, it's God's will. She said, I know that, but I don't think they're going to like it. So you have to, if you've not read it or studied it, you need to check it out because it is the best with help uh, that I could come up with, with what the responsibility of the wife is. In the biblical counseling world, I've had many, many women come to me for help and say, I don't love my husband anymore. Uh, They're discouraged. They say, I'm ready to leave him. I'm ready to divorce him. I wish I could love him, but he has hurt me too many times. And this creates a problem, a big problem, because Christians are to love others in an agape sense, All Christians are to love others in a self-sacrificing way. And then the Lord Jesus said the second greatest commandment is to love others. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And if that's the second greatest commandment, we should be really, we should know it. And we should know how to do it. And we should know, be really good at it. And Husbands, as Lou Priola says, are the wife's closest neighbor. So whatever true biblical love is, it must be something we can do by God's grace. He will help us. So in addition to agape love to her husband, the Apostle Paul specifically instructs the older women, the Titus II women, to encourage the younger women to love their husbands. And that's in Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Well, the Greek word there, the uh, New Testament was originally written in Greek. The Greek word there for love your husband is one word. It's a compound way, word. It's philandros. Philos is a, thinking of someone as very special, tender, Um, it's a sweet, beloved, dear friendship kind of love, and andros just means man or husband. Um, I'll give you an example of this. When our daughter Anna had her second pregnancy, it was twins, and she already had one little boy. He was two years old. When she found out she was going to have twins, she called me. She was all excited about it. And uh, she said, "Um, Mom, it's two babies. There's two babies. 
and I'm like rolling my eyes, but she can't see me. And uh, so I knew she would have, with Tommy, she would have three babies in diapers at the same time. She called back a few minutes later. She said, what if it's two boys? <laughs> I said, there's not enough grace in the world <laughs> for three boys. And she said, uh, I'm just gonna pray that at least one of them will be a girl. I said, it's too late. <laughs> I mean, God has determined this. Those babies are already forming in your womb. She said, I don't care. I'm going to pray that one of them will be a girl. I'm like, oh, my goodness. So I said, okay, you can pray, but it is too late. And it turned out both of them were girls. So um, anyway... When she had those baby girls, they were premature and they had to stay in the hospital a couple of weeks. So the day came when they were able to bring them home from the hospital. And so I was there and I was helping with Tommy in the house and um, Anna and her husband brought the babies home. She said, she set the nursery up now, they were premature and they were tiny little babies. And so she had these two great big cribs. And she put one little baby in one crib and one little baby in the other. And they weren't identical, but we were all the, we had to leave their name tags on because we couldn't, we were afraid we would get them mixed up. So when Sanford got off work, he came there. So he wanted to be in the, in the, mix and so he rang the doorbell and I opened the door and the first thing he said is where are the babies and I said well they're in the nursery and so he made a beeline for the nursery I made a beeline after him and the first thing he did was he went over to one crib see when they were in the hospital we we couldn't get our hands on them and so he looked at that baby, and I know what he was doing. He was counting her fingers and her toes and looking all angles. He didn't touch her, but he was thinking, she looks like me. <laughs> and so I'm standing back watching him do that because I had already done it. <laughs> In fact, I had held them. And... Uh, so that he just looked and looked and looked and then went over to the other crib and did the same thing. And the thought crossed my mind that I'm so grateful that the Lord has let us be together to have this moment. He is so dear to me. And I just had a warm, fuzzy feeling and tears in my eyes. That is Philos love, cherishing the other person. So is it possible for a wife to regain a love for her husband? This, the, it is. What if she never loved him? Can those feelings be restored? And of course we know you don't always have those feelings, um, but we need to look at two things from the scriptures. One is what love really is, and the second is what may have contributed to her apparent loss of love. So I want to go, uh, begin with an overview of three things that will destroy love. One of them is fear. In 1 Peter 3, verse 5 and 6, it says, For in this way in former times the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being, and this is their beauty, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. And then 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love cast out fear. And a second thing that will destroy love 
is bitterness. Now, the emotion that you feel when you're bitter is hurt. In Hebrews 12, verse 15, it says, See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that the, no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. So there's fear, there's bitterness, and it could be both of those things. And then third, selfishness. Selfishness is the most common thing that will destroy love. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says, love does not seek its own way. So you could say, love is not jealous, or selfish, I'm sorry. So point C, what must she do to begin loving her husband again? Well, she's going to have to, number one, repent from her fear, bitterness, and selfishness. And then number two, put on love. And the, I'm going to tell you how, by God's grace, to do that in a minute. When, when I'm counseling a wife who has a problem in her marriage, and after she tells me her story and tells me what's wrong, and I've heard some really, really difficult stories, and husbands can do very, they can be selfish, they can be mean, they can be all kinds of things. They can, they may not even be a believer. Um, but I have this whiteboard in my office, and so I will draw a circle on the board, and I'll say, if this circle represents a hundred percent of the problems in your marriage. What percent do you think is your fault? And what percent do you think is your husband's fault? Well, I've received some very interesting answers to that question. But suppose she says it's 70% his fault and 30% my fault. So I'll draw a line representing the 30%. And then I will say to her, the, what the Lord wants you to do right now is focus on your 30%. And then I will read them in uh, Matthew 7, what Jesus said about this. When somebody is sinning against you, Matthew 7 is part of the Sermon on the Mount. And he says... Um, This is that famous verse, do not judge so that you will not be judged. Now, it doesn't say we don't make righteous judgments. What he's saying here is, in verse 2, in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. So we are to make righteous, right judgments, but not judging motives we are we can't do that only the lord can do that um, and we are to just not be not be legalistic not like the pharisees are so verse 3 he says why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye but do not notice the log that is in your own eye or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, and behold, the log is in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So he's not saying you don't biblically deal with your husband's sin or the other person's sin, but... First, you have got to take work on your own sin. Now, <clears throat> if in a situation of abuse, uh, if the wife is in physical danger or there's some sort of emergency situation, uh, I will help her deal with that to begin with. But that's part of getting the beam out of her own eye is learning how to deal with difficult situations. 
So what I want to do for this lecture is focus on repenting from fear. I'm sorry, I'm not going to focus on repenting from fear, but we'll focus on repenting from bitterness. And then the opposite of that is to putting on love. So let's talk about bitterness. When a wife is bitter, she feels hurt. That's the, the they'll, I've had so many tell me, I'm not bitter, but I am hurt. Well, that's the emotion that you feel. Sometimes husbands hurt their wives' feelings by the things they do or say, or don't do or say. Uh, when she is hurt, and she, if she doesn't respond in a biblical way, then she will become embittered. And she can be thinking about things that he has done against her or that hurt her feelings. And it can go, it could have been years ago. But she thinks about it, she plays it over and over in her mind, and she feels like it is just happening right then. So after a while, it doesn't matter what the husband does or says, even if he tries to do the right thing, she's going to feel hurt. She's going to scoff at his motives. Um, and it is at the point that she feels hurt, it's critical how she responds. You can, you can either respond in a proud, sinful way, or you can respond in a humble way. The proud person is focused inward. The humble person is focused outward and upward, loving God. If she's proud, she's going to be thinking, I'm embarrassed. How could he do that to me? I would never do that to him. Um, she's going to feel very hurt and probably angry. The emotion you feel when you're angry is frustrated. And she, the, as she plays this over and over in her mind, she becomes more and more self-focused, more and more bitter, and eventually will probably be rebellious, totally against God and her husband, maybe leaving him, filing for divorce when she doesn't have biblical grounds for divorce. But if she responds in a humble way, and a humble, godly person, when the hurt happens, she's going to thank God for the test, not thank him for, oh, good, this is great, I love how he's treating me, but the focus is outward. Lord, how can I help him? How can I glorify you more in this? Um, she will feel hurt, but she, instead of playing the wrong bitter thoughts and vengeful thoughts over and over, she thinks kind, tender-hearted, forgiving thoughts, showing love, that's giving second mile blessings and forgiving him. Bitterness crushes out any gratefulness the wife may have. And it affects every area of her relationship with her husband. She will not feel love and feel hurt and resentful at the same time. And what she'll do is spiral down into self-absorbed bitterness. She's much more likely to misjudge his motives and his actions, even the really nice things he does for her. She scoffs at them and is suspect of them. Bitterness, whether it's toward a wife to her husband or a, a Christian towards anybody, is an extremely ugly sin and it permeates every facet of the person's being, and it comes out in some all kinds of, it, it spawns more and more sin, all kinds of vile ways. Bitter thoughts and statements would sound like the following. They're, they tend to be vengeful. I won't talk to him. I'll give him the silent treatment. 
He'll see what it's like when I'm gone. What goes around comes around. So he does this to me, somebody's going to do it to him. He'll be sorry, or I'll show him what it's like, or wishing ill will, or that something bad would happen to him. I hope he dies. I hope he's in a wreck. I hope blah, blah, blah. You can just go on and on. Another category of bitter thoughts are presumption, or you could say proud thoughts. And these kinds of thoughts judge his motive. Uh, He should know. He doesn't care about me. He only thinks of himself. There is no hope he will never change. I wish I had a nickel for every time I've heard that. We don't know that. God can change people. God can save people. And my dad got saved when he was 89 years old. It was amazing. He lived to be 93. And the fruit in his life was, it was just amazing. He was a different person. Uh, a bitter thought would be, he asked me what's wrong, but I'm not going to tell him because he knows. Okay, they have no clue. <laughs> I'm just telling you, they, they just shake their heads and scratch their heads and walk off. And the, they cannot read our minds, although we assume that they can. Uh, and then the presumption is... We think we know what the other person is thinking or why they did what they did, and it's their motive. Um, Only God can know their motive, and guess what? We are forbidden to judge motives. In 1 Corinthians 4, in verse 5, It says, Paul wrote, Therefore, do not go on passing judgment before the time. He's talking about before the time when Jesus comes back. But wait until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the things hidden in the darkness when he comes back and disclose the motives of men's hearts. And then each man's praise will come to him from God. We are forbidden to judge two things, other people's motives and things that are hidden. Um, I, I had a, an experience as I was a nurse's aide uh, for a few months before I went to nursing school because I wasn't really sure I wanted to go to nursing school. but. After my experience as as an aide, I was sure I didn't want to stay as an aide for the rest of my life. So um, we had this head nurse, and uh, we had this patient who was very difficult. And everybody tried to avoid this lady as much as, for good reason. And, um, but one night, one evening, she was my patient, and I went in there, and she had to have hot, wet compresses on her arm, and you had to go back 20 minutes later and change them and just keep you know, doing that. Well, there was one part where I put the hot, wet compresses on, and then I got pulled to another floor. So I didn't go back in and change her compresses. Well, this nurse at the end of the shift called me back and said, you did that deliberately to upset that lady. Okay, nobody in their right mind would have deliberately upset that lady because she was she'd be so ugly. And I said, I forgot, I'm sorry, it's my fault, but I wasn't thinking I'm going to do this deliberately to upset her. She just kept on, and finally I just stopped talking because she was judging my motive. Now, when Jesus comes back, and he will come back, he is going to judge our motives. 
and judge the hidden things that we've done. And, um, but he will take us, those that are born again and have been forgiven, to be with him. Sanford says, because I don't like heights, um, he said, when Jesus comes back and raises your body out of the grave, you're going to kick your feet and say, put me down. I said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be scared of him. So anyway, but when we presume to know what the other person is thinking, we have overstepped our bounds. This is God's way. Uh, he, only he can know what somebody is thinking or what they thought. So these bitter thoughts are just in, can be ingrained in us, and they come out like a bullet shooting at somebody else's heart. Um, you know they're bitter, or you know you're bitter towards someone if your thoughts are unforgiving, vengeful, self-centered, angry, and ungrateful. And they sound like things like, I gave him the best years of my life. Or why did God let this happen to me? Okay, the bitterness has shifted now to, from a person to God. Or I can't take it anymore. It, sound, it feels like it sometimes. How could he have done this to me? I would never have treated him that way. Or we never should have gotten married in the first place. <clears throat> that may be true. She may have uh, gotten herself into an unbiblical marriage. Uh, but they are married. And they made vows before God. And she then has to deal with the reality of what's happening. So there's no way a wife is going to love her husband and be bitter at the same time. So she's got to get the beam out of her own eye and first deal with her own bitterness. Well, how do you do that? Um, first of all, you have to recognize that bitterness is a sin. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32 Paul is talking about you're, you're not going to stop sinning until you start doing the right thing. And you're not going to stop thinking bitter thoughts until you start thinking kind thoughts and forgiving thoughts. In uh, chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath, that's explosive anger, and anger and clamor and slander, passing on bad reports. I had a pastor's wife, not one of our past, my pastor's wives, but from another church come to me for counseling. And every morning she would walk with her friend, a girl friend of hers, and uh, spend the whole time just bitterly telling on her husband, well, he did this, and he did this, and blah, 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 blah. I said, stop doing that. That's, if he's sinning, I'm going to teach you how to biblically confront him, but do it in love. Speak the truth in love. With the, Galatians 6 says, with the motive of restoring him, not just being... You're, you're slandering him, you're gossiping about him, and you're not going to him privately with his sin. And a lot of that was not even sin. He, she just, she at that point, hated her husband. Well, she stopped doing that with her friend. I don't know what they would talk about <laughs> when they didn't talk about him. But she began then to turn towards the Lord in obedience there. So, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander 
be put away from you along with all malice. Malice is meanness. A person that is an angry person is usually a mean person. Instead, though, verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. And here's the basis. Just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. We have no choice but to forgive. So recognize that bitterness is a sin. Secondly, confess that sin to God. If you're a believer, confess it. If you're an unbeliever, confess it and ask God to save you and grant you faith and repentance. 1 John 1, 9, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then thirdly, to overcome bitterness, you have to go the second mile to overcome bad feelings and to truly repent. Um, Matthew 5, verse 41, Jesus said, If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. Go above and beyond um, the call of duty. And then Matthew 7, verse 12, is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We, uh, an, another one of our counselors, a male counselor, and I counseled this couple that, uh, came to us. They only came two or three times, but they literally hated each other. I mean, I, it wouldn't have surprised me if one had killed the other one. And uh, they weren't Christians. And so, and, and the, the husband had never even been to church in his whole life. He had never opened a Bible. He did. We had to show him how to look up verses in the Bible because he, he just had never been taught. He didn't know. And so they were at literally each other's throats. And part of the homework that I gave them to do, I said, did you know the gold? Have you ever heard of the gold rule? Well, they both had heard of that. I said, did you know it's in the Bible? They didn't know that. So I quoted it from Matthew 7, verse 12. I said, Jesus said this. So part of your homework is this week, I want you to do three nice things for the other person. They don't deserve it, and but you just go beyond the call of minimum duty and do it and write it down. And um, I gave him my salvation worksheets to do uh, as also homework. They came back and they still, they were still not Christians at that point. I, I don't know that they ever became Christians, but they weren't at each other's throats so bad because just, over, we overcome evil with good, Romans 12, verse 21. So it's, uh, G, uh, Paul said, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So we fight back with doing something good for the person that we are bitter. Do extra things that you don't have to do. If a wife is bitter, she needs to focus, not on herself, but on pleasing her husband, not just completing the tasks that you know you're supposed to, to do. Zero in on pleasing him, and don't be like the nearsighted wife who's only looking at herself, but be like the farsighted wife with what would he like, what would please him. Um, that's kind of a robot if you just do the minimum that you have to do. Instead, she should think about what would please him from his perspective there. In 1 Peter 3, verse 8 and 9, it says, give a blessing instead. 
So this is a way she can give a blessing, even though he may not deserve a blessing. This is a way that she can overcome evil with good and fighting back. Think of something practical that you can do for your husband. Uh, think of something he would like. Prepare his favorite meal. At, at one point, now we've been married 55 years, and it took me a years to figure out, well, I just buy and cook the things I like. <laughs> Maybe I should ask Sanford <laughs> what he would like. Uh, and so uh, it, 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 I'm a little slow on the uptake <laughs> sometimes. But give him a back rub. Take his car and get gas for the car. Vacuum out his car. He would just probably be floored. Um, one time I counseled a lady whose husband was awful. I mean, he was selfish and mean and angry. And uh, she was just devastated. And she was so hurt and she was so bitter. And they didn't have much money. And um, every, she needed some new clothes really badly. And so every week when he would get his paycheck, they would save a little bit out of that to, for her to, to get some clothes. Well, weeks went by, and finally she had enough money to go shopping. And she, he knew that she was going to go shopping the next day. And I'm not talking about Saks Fifth Avenue shopping. I'm talking about Walmart and just trying to save money but trying to get some new clothes. And um, the husband knew that she was going to do that the next day. But that night before, he just was in a very bad mood, and he took it out on her, and he was so mean and ugly and the things that he said. And so the next day, she went shopping. And she came back with one thing, and it was wrapped up in a beautiful present. And uh, he came home, and he said, what did you get? Because he wanted her to have some new clothes. And she said, well, I changed my mind. I decided that I was going to buy you a present instead. And he said, why? And he said, especially the way I acted last night. And she said, well, I just wanted to give you a blessing instead. And there had been a jacket that he had admired uh, at some point when they were out. And he, but they couldn't afford it. I mean, even if it was time for him to go shopping for some clothes. She said, I, I took the money that we saved up and I bought you that jacket. And he just, he couldn't, he was incredulous. He couldn't believe it. He said, I still don't understand. And she said, it was important for me to give you a blessing. And so he opened up the box and there was the jacket. She could look at him in the eye and say, I love you. Maybe not feel love, but love is not selfish. And love rejoices in the truth. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It's kind. It was an amazing act of kindness to her, to him. So... Um, us giving a blessing to our husbands or to anybody else for that matter doesn't depend on him being nice or showing love to you. As I said, our responsibility is to fight back overcoming evil with good, Romans 12, 21, working hard at second mile investments because then you'll be glorifying God, amazingly so, by obeying his word and showing love to your husband. In Luke, it says God himself is kind to wicked and evil men and that we are to be merciful 
as our Father in heaven is merciful. A wife will tell me, I just can't forgive him. What he has done is so awful. Well, I will take her to Matthew 18. And this is the story that Jesus tells of the slave that owed so much to his master, there would be no way he could ever, ever repay his master. And so the master was going to sell him, sell the, his whole family off to different people, try to recoup some of his money. And the, the uh, slave begged, please don't do that. And he, so the master decided to forgive him that debt. And then his fellow slave owed him a small amount of money. And let me read you what it says here. Starting in verse 29 in chapter 18 of Matthew. So his fellow slave, well, verse 28, but that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, have patience with me and I will repay you. But... He was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And the Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. Now here is the scary part for us. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. That's the standard. God forgives us no matter what we have done, and we are to forgive others. Now, I tell my counselees, forgiveness and trust are two different things. What the husband has done is maybe so bad that you would be a fool to trust him. So you, you, but you still, in your heart, who you are on the inside, what you're thinking, you are to be kind to him, forgive him, ask God to help you forgive him, but then you may need to confront the husband's sin, and there's a chapter in uh, the Excellent Wife book, chapter 14, resources to protect the wife when her husband is sinning. And I go into great detail about different things that she can do or is to do uh, to help her husband with his sin. So f trusting him, you, you might be a fool to trust him with money after what he has done. Or... Trust him not to look at pornography after what he has done. But this, these are not unforgivable sins, but there are ways to biblically help him and to try to restore him to a right relationship with God. We have no choice but to forgive people. Um, so a wife is never going to stop being angry and bitter until she starts, and she's not going to feel like it, especially at first, being compassionate and forgiving. So 
She's got to put off her bitterness, but she's Roman numeral number three. She has to actively put on love. First, this, uh, First Timothy 4, 7 says, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. And that word discipline in the Greek is gymnazo, and it means, we get our word gymnastics from it, and it means doing it over and over again until you get it right. Well, when I'm counseling, almost always, one of the things that I teach my counselee is uh, the great, two greatest commandments. And when G uh, the Pharisees asked Jesus that question, what is the greatest commandment in the law? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, the Pharisees thought in terms of greater laws and lesser laws. And the ones that they said they had to keep in the Old Testament are the greater laws. The others they considered optional. Well, how convenient. <laughs> you can just decide for yourself what's important um, or not. But, of course, that wasn't true. But it wasn't odd that they asked him that question because they thought in those terms. And so he said um, the greatest commandment is to obey God. Jesus said in Matthew 14, if you love me, you will keep, I'm sorry, in John 14, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, um, the, but Jesus added a second greatest commandment. And that set, they didn't ask him that, but he added it. The second greatest commandment is to love others as you love yourself. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to learn to love yourself. Even if you put yourself down and think terrible thoughts about yourself, that is a self-focus. He's saying, if you focus on other people and want to do right by them and you show love to them, then you will, that would be the standard. So I think I said, I don't know if I said this earlier today or last night, so at some point I told somebody, it may have been y'all, that we should be really good at loving others. If that's that big of a deal that came out of our Lord's mouth, the second greatest commandment. So how do you do this? Well, you memorize 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7. And you know it backwards and forwards, and you learn to think that way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Love doesn't seek its own way. All of those things. And then you start thinking in those terms of how you can do this. Love is giving to the biblical needs of another person without having a motive of, well, what am I going to get back in return? In 1 John 3, 16, it says, By this we know love, that he, talking about Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Biblical love also is not always what the other person thinks they need, not necessarily, or what they might desire, um, but it is what and how God tells us to show love. And our motive, we can show love to people whether they return that love or not. It's something we can learn to do, it's something that we can discipline ourselves for the purpose of godliness and the Holy Spirit will convict us and enable us and give us grace to do that. So if we obey God and show love, our feelings will change for the better as you do the right thing. 
So I, I want mothers, there's a lot of mothers here, I know, to teach their children what love is. Love is patient. And when you were patient with your little brother or little sister, or you shared, love doesn't seek its own way. Love is kind. But you want to teach them to think in, in a positive way in those terms, but in a negative way also the opposite when they don't show love. You want your child to, as they get older and they get into dating, uh, you want them to think in terms of what true love looks like. And it, say you have a daughter and uh, she's dating some guy and he says, I love you. I want her to think, no, you don't. You are not kind to me. You are you're very selfish and you're not patient with me. And so saying I love you is really the meaningless. He may feel like he loves her or cares for her, but she, we want her to show love to him, but not um, fall for, I love you, I can't live without you, I'll kill myself if you don't marry me, you know, kind of thing. I would just say run for your life <laughs> from somebody like that. There's a really good book um, about, for, for young women, or any woman for that matter, Marry Well, Marry Wisely by Ernie Baker. We don't have it on our book table, but I can highly recommend that. All right, let me give you some practical examples of how to put on love. Love is patient. When irritation begins to build up, say to yourself, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Memorize that, James 1, verse 19 and 20. And then 1 Thessalonians 5, 18 says, Be thankful for all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me. That's another good one to memorize, 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. Or simply say to yourself, love is patient. I can show love by carefully listening to what my husband is telling me, whether I feel like it or not. Love is kind. Another example, if the husband is aggravated with the project he's trying to complete, say to him, I'm sorry, this is so aggravating. Now, you may be thinking, well, how stupid. <laughs> he doesn't know how to do that. He needs to get somebody else to do it. But anyway, don't tell it. Don't say, well, my dad could do better than you do. Uh, but you can say, is there anything that I can do to make it easier for you? That's kind. Love isn't jealous. Think, I would rather he stay home with me than go fishing but I'm glad for him, being glad for the other person that he's getting to go fishing. And act glad to see him when he comes home. Love doesn't brag. The word brag means to talk conceitedly. And conceit is an excessive appreciation of one's own worth. Be grateful for what your husband does, and do not take him for granted. And if you're going to boast, 2 Corinthians 10, 17 says, boast in the Lord. Love isn't arrogant. An arrogant wife is full of self-importance. She's opinionated. She's defensive with when somebody disagrees with her or reproves her, tells her what she's doing wrong, and tries to correct her. 
she can show love by being a humble servant to her husband, by listening carefully to his opinion and considering the possibility that she may be wrong. Now, maybe he's wrong, but at least she needs to carefully listen. Love is not rude, or love doesn't act unbecomingly. A wife can show love to her husband by acting in a respectful and not a rude manner. Uh, she shows love by not responding based on her mood or her hormones. Uh, Proverbs 12, verse 4, an excellent wife is the crown of her husband, but the wife who shames him is his rottenness to his bones, and that's how it makes him feel. Number seven, love doesn't seek its own way. The opposite of love is selfishness. And a wife can show love to her husband by giving in to his wishes as long as he's not asking her to sin. She shows love by considering her husband as more important than herself. Philippians 2, verse 4. Consider the other person as more important than yourself. Number eight, love is not provoked. A loving wife controls herself even under very difficult circumstances. I'm looking at my watch here. Uh, she shows love by thinking about how she's going to respond rather than just reacting. And then she realizes that 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, is true, and it says no trial or pressure or temptation, you can translate that word all those ways, uh, has overtaken you, but such is common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be pressured beyond what you're able to bear. And then number nine, love doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Uh, she corrects herself and stops playing. He did this and he did that and he did this. Uh, and then taking it one step further, he did that deliberately to hurt me. Um, and then number 10, love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. A loving wife is one who not only deals properly with the sin in her life, but doesn't entice, influence, or provoke her husband to sin. But she speaks the truth to him in love. And one of the byproducts of being righteous is that she, at the same time, She's acting in a biblical way, a righteous way. She is showing love. Number 11, love bears all things, includes times when her husband is sinning or he's having a rough time at work. Uh, she is committed to her husband, and he knows it. I remember when Sanford, when the air, some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but years ago, uh, the, the uh, air traffic controllers went on strike, and Sanford was an air traffic controller. Well, he had decided not to strike, and um, so, but they were extremely short-handed because Reagan fired so many of them, and uh, he ended up working six days a week for a year and a half, not he, he certainly no vacation, and um, I remember one evening we were, I had prepared supper and the four of us were sitting around, and I would get up and go go get Sanford's plate and um, replenish it or whatever, and David said he was just a kid, but he said. Well, Mom, why don't you do that for me? <laughs> I said, your daddy is tired, and I, I'm showing love to him. And David didn't say anything else. Uh, so love believes all things, uh, painting the other person in the best possible light. Love hopes all things, and her hope is based on Christ and in him. Romans 10, 11 says, you will never be disappointed. Her hope 
is rooted in the eternal king of glory. And she knows that God can be glorified even if her husband is not a Christian. She can tell herself, my husband has disappointed me, but God never will. God can use what he's done to heap burning coals on his head, Romans 12, and put pressure on him to repent. Love endures all things. Every time she endures a difficult situation by, and responds in a righteous, loving way, uh, she is showing love to God. She can think, this is very difficult, because it's true, if it, if it is, that, but God will give me the grace to endure. And every day that I endure, I'm showing love to God and love to my husband. Love never fails. She, love, a wife shows love to her husband by keeping on being patient, keeping on being kind, keeping on being unselfish, etc. And she shows love to God by obeying God's word. So we put off selfishness by putting on love. Love is an action. It's something that we can choose to do. It is a command from our Lord uh, in the agape sense is sacrificial love. In um, a philos sense, it's thinking of him as someone you cherish, someone who is special to you. So let's pray. Father, we, these principles don't just apply from a wife to her husband. It applies to all of us in our relationships with our family, with our friends, even with our acquaintances. And I pray that we will take this seriously and that we will memorize these things and that you will help us to renew our minds and to be a living sacrifice for you and that we will learn to not be selfish and learn to show love and even confront sinful things in love because love rejoices in the truth. It doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.